while Gehrig was honored by friends, family, and teammates, including one with whom he had not spoken since 1934. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to look for. Thank you. This is a big deal. Big deal for us, big deal for the Chautauqua Striders, and big deal for those folks in the community because we have a moment in time. The moment in time is that we are able today to listen to Jonathan Ig. Jonathan Ig wrote the book. <laughs> the Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig. And this is occurring on the 75th anniversary of his speech. This guy is a big deal. He has written several, several best-selling uh, books, including Jackie Robinson, which is incredibly well-received, not only publicly, but the family as well, as we just had Sharon here not that long ago. Uh, did a wonderful book on Al Capone, and of course did this best-selling book called The Luckiest Man. So without further ado, Jonathan I. Thank you so much, and thanks to Greg and to Mark and everybody in Chautauqua for bringing me here. and making me feel so welcome every time I come to visit. Um, it was 75 years ago, almost to the day, that Lou Gehrig stood on a field, Yankee Stadium, right at home plate in front of a microphone, not very different from this one, 61,000 people in the audience, and declared himself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. In the spring of uh, 1939, he had never missed even a spring training game. That's how obsessive he was about this street. You know, he's a German, I mean, very disciplined. Um, and he was also he also wanted to show that he was not Babe Ruth, who was always, you know, taking a day off because he was hung over. Ruth was so proud of this streak. But finally, in spring training of 1939, he took a couple days off. He said he just didn't feel right. When the first game of the season started, of course, he was in the lineup and he played the first week or so. Finally, he took himself out of the lineup because he said he was embarrassing the team. He was he was actually couldn't stand to hurt the team anymore. There were routine ground balls that were going through his legs. His teammates were afraid to throw the ball to him at first base because they didn't think he could get his glove up in time. This is how bad he looked. And the press all said, what the hell is wrong with Gehrig? The reporters were all saying, it's like he's aged overnight. You know, maybe playing every game for 14 years, you don't age normally. Maybe you just age all at once. This was the kind of speculation that was going on in the newspaper. So he took himself out of the lineup, thought that maybe taking a little time off would make him feel better, would rejuvenate his strength, thought maybe he had a virus of some kind. But when he didn't feel better, he finally decided it was time to go see a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. And he'd been to see doctors before, but never the kind of neurologists. Uh, neurologists were, were pretty rare back then. Uh, he'd never been referred to one. But finally at the Mayo Clinic, he went to see a neurologist. And the minute he walked in the office, took off his shirt, the neurologist knew it was ALS. It was so obvious. With ALS, uh, what happens is the muscles tend to melt away, but they melt away unevenly, more on one side than the other. That's what the AMIO means. In, in Lateral, I'm sorry, lateral means uneven. Um, so Gehrig knew, was told that this was a fatal disease, that most people lived no more than a couple of years with it, and certainly knew that his, he was done playing. He came back to New York with a letter to the Yankees explaining what this disease meant and why he couldn't play anymore. And the Yankees decided they wanted to honor him, and that's why they had this game. Uh, in between games of a doubleheader on July 4th, 1939, Washington Senators, 61,000 people there. And all of Gehrig's former teammates from the 1927 Yankees, including Babe Ruth, came out to honor him. Um, the mayor of New York, Fiorello LaGuardia, was there. And they all made speeches. They presented Gehrig with these gifts. And because he was so shy, he told his manager he really did not want to speak. He preferred just to wave to the crowd and thank everybody and, and walk away. But the crowd was roaring, we want Lou, we want Lou. And finally, his manager, Joe McCarthy, whispered in his ear and gave him a shove up to the microphone. And we don't know if Gehrig prepared any remarks. We don't know if he thought about it the day, night before. We don't know if he had anything written out. Um, I suspect that he had certainly thought about what he would say because he was such a careful, such a thoughtful man, and he didn't like to be unprepared for anything. And if you think about the words that he uttered that day, they sound like someone who'd given some thought to what he wanted to get across. And what he said was, for the past two weeks you've been reading about a bad break. Yet today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Who wouldn't consider themselves lucky to have been a Yankee?
to have played with all these fine men that you see on the field here today. Who wouldn't consider themselves lucky to have a wife like mine, to have a mother and a father who raised me to be big and strong and to be a good person? Even my mother-in-law sides with me and fights with, his, with, with, with her daughter, he says. He, makes, he starts a little joke. He goes on to thank the opponents who sent him gifts, to think that all these years he hated the New York Giants and here they were sending him gifts. He was so moved by that. He thanks the ushers. He thanks the groundskeepers. And then at the end he says, so while I might have been given a bad break, I have an awful lot to live for. And he puts his head down and takes his baseball cap in his hands and scrunches it and walks off the field. And as you know, in the Gary Cooper movie, Pride of the Yankees, that's the last thing we see. And for most people who know about Lou Gehrig, that's the last thing they know. It's the last image that we have in our heads. But Gehrig lived for another two years. And I set out to research those years to find out what kind of a man he really was, how he faced that illness, because more than the baseball, I was interested in how he handled that challenge. He spoke so eloquently, but then he had to de go off and deal with this thing on his own. And in the course of my research, I found 200 pages of letters that Gehrig had written to his doctor as he was dying, letters that nobody had ever seen before. And as I said when I began this talk, I began not knowing very much about Lou Gehrig and hoping that I would like who I found. And even when I, when I heard these letters existed and when I was waiting to get my hands on them, I became concerned. What if the Gehrig who's revealed in these letters is not the man that I had him cracked up to be? What if he reveals himself to be depressed, angry, he would have been entitled to those feelings. What if he revealed himself to be a Dodger fan of all things? You know, it could have been really sad. Um, but in these letters, Gehrig is so strong. He goes on to talk to his doctor about all these experimental treatments that he's undergoing, and how even though he believes that they're not doing anything for him, there's hope that maybe they'll work for the next guy. And when it becomes really clear that this isn't working, that his muscles are melting away, and he describes it in such painful detail about all the different parts of his body beginning to fail, even when he knows that death is coming soon for him, he begins using these letters to ask for favors from the doctor for other people in his life. His wife is under so much stress, she's breaking out in rashes. Is there something you can send her? One of his teammates' wives uh, is having stomach trouble. Can you recommend a good doctor here in New York? He turns his attention to other people. And I fell in love with Gary reading these letters, um, even more than I had fallen in love with him as a Yankee fan as a child, and even more than I had in researching his amazing career. And when I think about those words, when I think about Garrett calling himself the luckiest man on the face of the earth, I know now what he meant. And it's something that I think we can all relate to. And I know that patients, when they're diagnosed with ALS, their doctors often say to them, look, this is Lou Gehrig's disease. And it means something to them. It means that this is a disease that, that is associated with weakness, but we think of it in connection with this man of such great towering strength. And Garrett gave us this message of hope. He said, no matter what happens, we all die someday. We all will lose our loved ones. But what you can focus on is the reasons we have to be lucky, the reasons we have to thank God for what life has given us. And that's what he was clinging to that day. That's what he was saying meant so much to him. So I feel like in that speech, in this brief three minutes that he spoke, he gave us all something that we can carry with us. And I'm just so proud to be able to carry on 75 years later and help reinforce and remind people of that message. Thank you very much. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. That I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. Thank you.